Hello everyone, I'm Tony Inadio, a mentor at Empire State College here at the Northeast Center in Latham. This is the first video lecture for the course History of Management. Uh, I have to stand in one place to film this because otherwise you won't be able to see me and I have to keep the screen a bit farther in the background. Uh, this was the only way I could make everything work reasonably. So. Uh, will have to bear with the technology. Um, the subject of history and management uh, is one that we discuss as faculty quite a bit here at Empire State College because there's two sides to this argument as to how important is this in the field of business management and economics. I mean, it would seem that the history of management would be important to management, but on one hand, if we think about uh, an, an example in the 19th century, the Lowell Mills, trying to manage based on that model today would not only not work, it would probably be illegal. So the methods by which uh, that mill was run is probably not valid today. So a lot of management has to be up to date. So how valuable then is knowing the history? Um, so, with that in mind, I've tried to focus on principles, fundamentals, and how they are, in fact, extensions of our own life, our day-to-day -day life. Principles such as um, planning, uh, controlling, organizing, staffing, conflict resolution, problem solving, things that managers do. And if we think about this more broadly, those are things that we do in our own lives as well. So to look at the history of management, probably some of the specific examples won't be useful to us today. But if we focus on the fundamentals, uh, I think that we'll find that there is quite a bit of similarity. And we also have to remember that management isn't just management of a business or a company or uh, any group of people in that um, making money is the ultimate goal. It's uh, a subject which can be applied in lots of different ways. I mean, you can look at the management of warfare. You can look at the management of a household. You can look at the management of uh, a church or even something that in a sense doesn't involve people at all, the management of information, which you're using computer systems. So if we think about management in a very broad perspective and look at how the fundamentals apply, hopefully we can find something useful and therefore the history of management will have some value to us. But even if we think about things that are very current in management practice, um, as soon as it's sort of implemented, it has, a, I guess you might say, a shelf life. And uh, as soon as something is done, it becomes part of the past. So in a certain sense, everything we do and that we study is in some way, shape, or form based on history. So what we're going to try to do in this course is look at uh, the basic principles, how they apply to everyday life, and uh, how specific examples throughout history have worked out. So we're going to begin with uh, the colonial period. Okay, there we go. Uh, bear with me. Um, what we're looking at is the first settlement in, in America, uh, the Jamestown settlement. The uh, cost of crossing the ocean was fairly substantial. You can just get in a, a ship and cross the ocean. In order to fund the voyage, joint stock companies were formed. And the purpose of the stock company was, of course, to make money. The people who came over were following the lesson of Spain. You know, they came over, they plundered the New World, and they became very wealthy. So the uh, settlers, or they would become settlers uh, shortly, um, really planned to just land, scoop up the gold, stay for a while, and then go back to England and live like country gentlemen. They certainly weren't prepared to survive. And when they landed, they picked a place that was strategically important in terms of its protection from Spain, 
but it wasn't the best place for them to land in terms of their uh, health and well-being. And as I said, they certainly weren't prepared to survive. And when they couldn't find the gold and the jewels just laying all around, uh, suddenly they were faced with hunger and they had to eat. And um, they really were uh, not prepared for this and they certainly didn't want to have to do the work. Uh, I won't go into all of the details about the history, but the, the key point here in terms of our course is you can look at the, the efforts of John Smith who understood that if they were left to their own devices, they would either starve to death or be killed by Indians or what have you, um, that he had to impose some sort of order and discipline. He's famous for saying, you know, he who does not work shall not eat. And as soon as uh, discipline is imposed, um, there's a little bit of, of, of a toehold here. And you can see the initial a settlement is very, very small, and it would stay that way for quite some time. Without having gold to pick up, um, the joint stock company didn't really make any money. And in fact, it never really makes any money. The only way to recoup some of their losses was to sell more stock. However, um, it never really pays off. The place where they had landed, as I said, was... Um, good for defensive purposes, not so good for health. It was very hot, very swampy, lots of mosquitoes. Um, the water was very brackish, very salty. Um, it wasn't very uh, healthy. But the one advantage the land did have was it turned out to be good farmland. And pretty soon, one of these uh, settlers, John Rolfe, discovered that by planting tobacco, he could raise a crop that could be sold in England profitably. It's a classic case here of production driving consumption rather than the other way around. The, uh, the farmers in Virginia uh, the more that they could produce to satisfy, I mean, certainly they're responding to demand, but it's the fact that they were able to produce tobacco in large quantities to sell to England or in Europe at large that drove the market for tobacco. The Indians had grown tobacco for a long time, but they never grew it commercially. Um, that had changed with Rolf, and you can see on the bottom uh, paintings from the 17th century, people doing smoking tricks and things like that. But growing tobacco was very complicated. It um, required lots of labor. And in order to ensure a good product, it isn't just like growing corn or something, where you plant the corn and you, you know, water it and all that, you grow corn. Tobacco required a lot of kind of agricultural engineering to ensure a very good crop because it's a very fickle plant and it can very easily produce leaves that are not pleasant to smoke. And smokers were demanding sort of finest leaves. So quality control becomes a very, very big issue. And uh, farmers were known for their particular uh, abilities here. So in order to grow good crops, you needed very good people. In order to get labor, um, most people in England uh, who wanted to come over, who didn't have enough money to fund the trip, did have one thing that they could bargain with, and that was their labor. So they would enter an agreement to work for a period usually of about seven years. You would have a contract that was signed in duplicate, and it would be cut, as you can see on the top there, uh, it would be cut in a particular way so that the signatures, the identical language, and the fact that they fit together um, made the contract legal and binding. The little uh, squiggly at the top often looked like dentures, and so these people were called indentured servants. Unfortunately for many of them, they never saw, the, most of them never see the end of their term. Uh, a lot of them died. The mortality rates in Virginia were extremely high. And the uh, masters always found ways to extend their uh, period of indenture if they didn't work hard enough or if they broke a tool or things along those lines. So very few of them actually saw uh, freedom, and that would include um, freedom 
a piece of land, and there was usually something else thrown in there as an incentive, uh, a suit of clothes, a chest of drawers, things of that nature. In 1619, a Dutch ship arrives with some 20 African slaves. And this brings slavery to the New World. But slavery itself had existed throughout history in virtually every single culture. Um, as we look at slavery in the New World, we're going to focus on America's particular brand of slavery, which turned out to be racial slavery. The uh, slaves were valued for their ability to work, obviously, but in, as opposed to indentured servants, you didn't have to free them. You just had to keep them alive, and as long as you could keep them alive, then you could uh, continue to reap the benefits. So when we look at how these early planters, as they are trying to take advantage of this very lucrative market, um, they have to manage slaves, and they have to manage a farm. And what we're looking at on the bottom, uh, or on the top, you can see slaves working on a tobacco plantation. As they say, tobacco is very labor-intensive. But on the bottom, on the lower right-hand side, you see slave cabin, um, and that one on the Carter Plantation in Virginia. The one on the right is, is, more, is more similar to a planter's cabin a person who would own the land and have the slaves. There isn't a lot of difference, and most of these early planters are working alongside their slaves. It isn't the sort of 19th century version of slavery that we're more accustomed to. Um, these were men who worked alongside their slaves, and of course, um, you know, it was in their interest to keep these uh, slaves uh, working profitably, so it isn't like they just whipped them every single day. Uh, you simply can't do that to your workforce, although it's not as if they treated them very well either. But most of them, including the planters, were living very close to the earth, we might say. After a period of, oh, maybe uh, eight to ten years of, of, of growing tobacco, it became necessary for uh, the planters in Virginia to kind of organize themselves more formally. And they do this with uh, a, a, an institution of government known as the House of Burgesses. It was largely modeled on Parliament. There was a governor's council of men that he picked, and then there was a representative body elected by free planters, a bicameral legislature. So even here, they very quickly realize the need for a form of management, in this case, legal management, in order to make sure that their interests were being served and that uh, their relationships among each other were uh, moving as smoothly as they possibly could. Of course, like every political body, there was lots of uh, contentious issues. Meanwhile, the other settlement is in the Massachusetts Bay. And these settlers come for a completely different reason. The settlers in the Chesapeake had largely come for money. The people in the Massachusetts Bay largely came for, uh, or came to practice their, religious, their religion freely. They didn't come for religious freedom because they certainly didn't believe in religious freedom themselves. Uh, they came to practice their religion freely, but in their uh, small communities, as you can see, they're not that much different than the Chesapeake Bay. They also had to manage uh, their communities, both politically and religiously, and find some way to survive. Uh, they don't really have, um, as I say, the same commercial interests. And in fact, you really couldn't commercially farm the land in New England. It's very rocky, very hilly soil. In Virginia, we'll kind of go back and forth between the two settlements. In Virginia, um, as it became a much more prosperous and populous society, of course you're going to have clashes. As I mentioned, you know, politics is always a, a cause for conflict. And uh, you end up having people with political power against those who don't have political power. And one of the more famous events is uh, Bacon's Rebellion of 1676, um, an early uh, form of warfare in the colonies, which by now there are several. Of course, they had problems with Indians and had to organize and fight Indians and so on. 
Uh, but this was largely a fight amongst themselves uh, for control of land, for protection on the frontier from Indians and things like that. These uh, re rebels felt that the governor wasn't doing uh, his job well enough and that they didn't have enough representation in government. Um, it ultimately collapses, but some of the issues here, the right to bear arms and things like that, are uh, common themes that we'll see uh, throughout uh, the course throughout American history. Um, this map is um, a map of uh, the Carolinas, and it sort of underscores one of the um, benefits of, of, the, of the territory, and that was for the purposes of plantations. Uh, the land in, in the territory was very fertile, and a number of uh, crops were uh, planted profitably. Um, we've already looked at tobacco. Uh, this is an example of an indigo farm. Uh, indigo is a plant that, after very extensive processing, can be turned into a dye. Uh, like tobacco, it is very, very labor-intensive and very much reliant on slave labor. The slaves had brought with them uh, one of their staple crops, which turned out to be rice. It, initially, rice was very difficult, if not impossible, to grow. But in South Carolina, it had some geographical advantages that made uh, the cultivation of rice possible. And the people who knew how to, how to plant that rice were the slaves. Um, they had all of the skills. They uh, uh, were um, accustomed to working in heat. They were largely seasoned in terms of having already had things like malaria and yellow fever. Um, they knew how to grow the crop. They could navigate rivers very well um, because use, uh, growing rice involves, as you can see, the flooding of fields and so on. Um, so they had all of the skills that if you were a businessman, you would hire them. Instead, uh, they were enslaved for it. But it proved to be a very lucrative uh, cash crop. In uh, North Carolina, uh, there were uh, lots of uh, forests of pine trees, and uh, pine, pine trees have a lot of uses in shipbuilding um, for tall masts. Uh, here you can see a slave uh, sc uh, scoring a tree uh, to collect the pitch or the sap, and then on the left you can see an underground kiln in which they would cut up the wood and essentially heat it. Uh, which, with all the water content, would sort of boil the, the wood itself, and out of it would flow the tar, um, which, of course, got all over the ground, which got all over their feet, and that's one of the reasons why North Carolina is the Tar Heel State. Uh, but it was, of course, very useful in shipbuilding, as it was uh, a waterproofing agent. In the North, uh, since they couldn't really engage in commercial farming, the one thing that they had an abundance of was cod. So uh, Cape Cod and cod fishing and whaling and things like that, that's really what made um, the northern uh, settlement uh, profitable. I'm not going to recount all of the details of American history, but what I want to do is point out the sort of instances where business uh, and the management of people is important and takes steps forward. Uh, this is another one. So you're looking at a, a dinner service, a very fancy one, something that at the time in the 17th century and into the 18th century, only very wealthy people would own. But the colonies were proving very productive. There were lots of natural resources. There was a steady increase of population, and of course people have to work, they have to make money, they have to survive. And what ends up happening is that it starts to fuel what historians call the consumer revolution of the 18th century. And the um, trade involved made a lot of people uh, very wealthy. So we have uh, items such as a dinner service, which were once only owned by the very wealthy, are now um, able to be purchased by um, the middle class, you might say. And we're looking at some examples of how people lived, and in some cases it's not very nice, it's very crude, a log cabin with waddle and dog, you know, just some crude stools around a 
a fire uh, place with a pot hanging in it, everybody eating around it. Uh, we have some uh, boards on the wall with cups where we get our uh, modern cup boards or cupboards from. And then we have the image on the upper right, which is uh, something a little more recognizable to us, a better fireplace, a table, chairs, plates, and so on. And this is what's happening in colonial America. People are becoming wealthier and able to uh, raise their standards of living. So in order to do that, um, you have to be able to make money. And usually you had to be able to manage uh, your household, which is where most of this manufacturing took place. And we'll look at that in a little more detail uh, afterward. For education, most uh, people uh, were educated in the home. Most children were educated in the home, and they were really only educated as far as they needed to be educated to, you know, work on the farm or, you know, uh, catch fish or something like that. But increasingly, uh, people with money were able to send their children uh, to Europe, and they would do what's called the grand tour. They would visit all the cities and, and uh, collect things along the way, bring them back, and display them in their houses. Here we see cabinets of curiosities, which will uh, eventually uh, lead to museums. When people die, you have to take care of things, and usually it's easier to donate something. And so people are now uh, paying money to see these objects of, of curiosity. And what it, re what it underscores is uh, an increasingly global economy. And I always use that term with a little hesitation because the economy has really always been global. People will trade as far as they can travel. But what we're seeing here in the consumer revolution is a fairly rapid increase in trade, prosperity, and rising standards of living where people can devote themselves to things beyond mere survival, uh, things of luxury. Uh, here we see um, a loom, um, a spinning wheel, a butter churn. These are uh, objects we might associate with drudgery today. However, uh, at the time they were labor-saving devices and people who could afford them were pretty happy to get them. And of course this also comes out of the consumer revolution. Uh, people were uh, uh, able to afford these uh, machines and it increased their productivity, which, as I said, take, took place mostly in the home. Now, much of that work that you can see is, of course, done by women. In the earliest uh, days of the colonial period, women worked in the fields uh, with everyone else. Everybody's labor was necessary. However, with the growth of indentured servants and then later, of course, slaves, um, the mark of a successful planter was one who could uh, bring his wife in the home, so she didn't do field work. It was a mark of status, much as a cabinet of curiosity was a mark of status. And so it isn't the first time in history that a woman's place is in the home or, you know, women do the work in the home, um, but it is a time at which we see this greatly increasing. And of course, I'm over generalizing a bit here, but uh, to make the point, this is happening. And what the other thing that happens is that women find themselves with labor-saving devices with a little bit more time on their hands. And one of the things that they do with that time is they educate their children. They're educating their children um, beyond this sort of traditional farm knowledge that they might need. Um, they're teaching them reading, writing, and arithmetic and all of that. But there's also something going on in Europe that uh, has a great impact on what's going on in America, and that is the Enlightenment. The notion that we can apply scientific principles to the problems of society and solve all of our problems. We can study human beings like we study the motions of the planets. And that leads to John Locke's Second Treatise of Government, the concept of natural rights, Montesquieu's uh, separation of powers and things like that. And that, those are the ideas that a lot of these kids are now being exposed to. And uh, it's very interesting that the children of the consumer revolution will take those ideas and when they grow up, uh, will fight the American revolution on those uh, very same principles and we'll come to that a bit later. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of trade uh, between uh, Europe 
Africa and America. It's known as the triangle trade. And we can see here, we have finished goods uh, coming from Great Britain, traded for slaves in Africa. The slaves are brought to the New World and traded for raw materials, which are then turned into finished goods and things of that nature. Uh, it's a bit more complex than that, but that's essentially the basic mechanics of the trade itself, and it is um, rapidly increasing. Alongside business prosperity is, the, is religious um, uh, propagation, I guess we could say. It's called the, the Great Awakening. We sometimes now refer to it as the First Great Awakening because of the Second Great Awakening in the 19th century. But the First Great Awakening was about uh, reaching out to the masses with these new methods of preaching, out of which comes Methodism. These uh, preachers would preach to pretty much anyone, anywhere. Uh, they encouraged active participation. They uh, still believe in the notion of predestination, but they uh, believe also that you are in control of your spiritual life, that it isn't just up to an organized church. So it's a more decentralized, uh, maybe you could say anti-management, um, uh, approach to religion, but it also encouraged a lot of people to become organized in religion. And of course, many of those uh, bodies of people will organize themselves into congregations um, and manage themselves just like other churches of other denominations. Uh, additionally, you have uh, um, uh, printing. It's hard to overstate how much of an impact printing has on uh, colonial America. Uh, here we see Ben Franklin in his famous Poor Richard's Almanac. But what Poor Richard's Almanac really is, is an organization of knowledge. In other words, it's a way for uh, 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 many streams of knowledge to be brought together for the purpose, in a sense, of management. You can take this document, uh, this book or pamphlet, and understand what you needed to do uh, to manage your farm or even just to live life. There was always the, the aphorisms and plenty of advice in there on how best to live your life. So in a sense, it's a management manual uh, that was extremely successful. And then, of course, printing becomes a very, very large part of, of the American narrative. But England, as I've been talking about, isn't really the only uh, European power here in America. You have France and Spain and the Netherlands and Sweden and a lot of other uh, uh, countries. But the main two competitors are England and France, the long-term adversaries. And what we are looking at here is a map of the French and Indian War. Um, it's called the French and Indian War in America, it's sometimes called the Seven Years' War, but that's the sort of larger uh, war. This is the American theater of it. And you can see the territory claimed by France, the territory claimed by Britain, and in the middle where it says ceded, that is the territory which they were fighting over, and they're largely fighting over this for business purposes. It's um, a, a very lucrative in the fur trade and things like that. And of course, there's a, a, a controlling territory in the New World uh, the more territory you control, the greater your prestige at home. So this is seen as a sort of satellite of these European nations, and it's a way for them to enhance their prestige. England will win this uh, war and uh, take control of uh, much of North America, although France isn't totally out of the picture yet. But in the uh, exercise of warfare, um, uh, there's the paying for the war, and uh, the war was very expensive, and Britain expected uh, the colonies to pony up the dough to pay for the war. After all, they had fought the war, uh, the colonists were benefiting. The colonists uh, didn't want to pay for the war because they believed that this is England's country, and um, if you want to fight for it, that's fine. This is your country, it's your responsibility. Furthermore, the taxes imposed, we can see here the, the dreaded stamp tax, were to be collected and paid directly to Britain. And this, this really hadn't happened before. Most of the taxes were collected locally and administered locally. 
And of course, the colonists were outraged about this, and uh, it's one of the events that will lead to the Revolutionary War. Again, I'm not going to go through all of the details here because we just need to look at the sort of management aspects and um, how that uh, applies in a variety of, of circumstances. So again, we have another war which has the same um, uh, challenges as a business. I mean, you have inventory control, you have planning, you have strategy, you have competition, uh, you have to execute the plan, you have to direct the actions of a lot of people, a lot of different people doing lots of different tasks. Uh, division of labor, all of the things that we are very uh, familiar with in business, uh, we can see in the execution of warfare, except here uh, the consequences uh, could be uh, permanent as they could be deadly. So uh, we win the war and uh, after the war uh, write the Constitution of the United States, which um, I won't get into um, because uh, the more important um, a content for our purposes is what happens in the aftermath with how the country is going to sort of manage itself. Very early on, uh, a battle that takes place amongst political parties, although they didn't call themselves parties then, uh, between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists was over the notion of a national bank, a nationally chartered bank. The uh, Federalists were uh, in favor of it, saying we have to pay our debts, the government has to collect revenue, therefore the bank is necessary and proper and justified. And uh, the Anti-Federalists countered, well, there's nothing in the Constitution giving the federal government the right to charter a bank. Um, the Federalists get their way and we have the first bank of the United States. It isn't the first bank of the United States, there were other banks. Um, but this is the first one chartered by the government, and it will sort of set the, the stage of massive, uh, the massive size of the banking industry, which would have grown anyway, but it gets a very, very early boost uh, with this uh, a charter. And of course, banking and money are uh, keys to business, and I'm one of the earliest people uh, to take advantage of business in America. I mean, there were a lot of people who made a lot of money in America, but uh, John Jacob Astor becomes America's first millionaire. So a lot of people make a lot of money, a lot of people are very wealthy, but this is a man who literally um, maybe fulfilled the American dream first and best in that he became a millionaire uh, through, um, his, through his efforts. Of course, he runs a fairly large organization. He has people, who, I mean, he doesn't trap all of the beaver himself, beaver furs being his main uh, commodity early on. Um, he has networks of trappers that go out, they have to deal with Indians and so on. So we have um, a man who is managing uh, an early a business that becomes phenomenally uh, successful and of course sets the stage for lots of other people uh, to do the same. So we have to also look at the role of technology in business. And this is Eli Whitney and his famous cotton gin, the name gin short for engine. In the South, in addition to tobacco and indigo and rice and naval stores like hemp and tar and all that, um, a short staple cotton had become a very lucrative crop which of course is largely grown by slaves. The uh, cotton has seeds in it that are very sticky and very difficult to pull out of the cotton. A talented slave could pluck maybe a pound of cotton clean per day. The cotton gin was essentially a series of rollers that grabbed the cotton fibers through a series of fingers and so just the fibers made it through the seeds would fall out and simply by feeding the cotton into the gin and turning a crank that was it uh, a person uh, could clean 50 pounds of cotton a day so think about this if you were to increase your productivity at your job by 50 percent your boss would be very pleased with you 
But if you could improve your productivity by 50 times, I mean, that's saying something. Now, there's a take on the cotton gin that the cotton gin spread slavery throughout the South. Uh, but this is not really accurate because, for one thing, the cotton gin is, an, is a machine. Machines don't have a conscience. Uh, the machine didn't spread slavery through the South. Men spread slavery through the South. What we do know is that after the cotton gin appears, slavery explodes in the South. And uh, one of the arguments the slave owners had, had often made is that they couldn't afford to pay their slaves, that it wouldn't have been profitable, uh, the whole system would have collapsed. However, whenever you can increase productivity by 50 times, uh, you could pay them. If anything, the cotton gin could have ended slavery, but it didn't, and it didn't because these men did not want to end slavery. It's just that simple. But the, the, but the, the entire uh, slave-owning South is becoming so uh, wealthy, and um, their wealth is translating into political power. And that becomes a bit of a problem for the nation later on, which we'll get to at the end. Um, meanwhile, the United States had uh, purchased uh, land from France, the land that they had once held in the aftermath of the French and Indian War. Um, a lot of debate as to whether this is even constitutional or not, and Jefferson, the strict constructionist, is the one who does it, and the people you'd think would be in favor of it, the Federalists, were sort of opposed to it. But nonetheless, he effectively doubles the size of the United States. And, uh, of course, with Jef Jefferson's agrarian ideal, uh, he saw the future of the country as a nation of farmers, um, as opposed to Hamilton's view, who saw the future of America as a nation of commerce, as a nature of manufacturing. You know, and there's always this debate, whose world do we live in? Um, in a sense, we sort of live in both of their worlds, because uh, in a sense, we're still a nation of, of farmland anyway, just so we have far fewer people working it, but our farmland is the, some of the most productive in the world, but we are essentially a commercial and manufacturing nation. But in this instance, you have uh, a doubling of the size of the United States, and of course Jefferson wants to know what's out there, as do a lot of other people. He sends the famous Lewis and Clark expedition to sort of explore um, uh, the resources, and of course Maybe they'd find that Northwest Passage, who knew, but it never happened. In 1809, um, Robert Fulton successfully uh, uh, puts a steam engine on a boat. Uh, other people had done this. I mean, this is something in history that you run across a lot. Somebody gets credit for something, and it seems like no one else had ever done it before. Um, but that's not usually true, even with Eli Whitney. He gets a, a lot of credit for interchangeable parts, and um, a lot of other people had done that and done it successfully before Eli Whitney. He certainly had the idea, he certainly practiced it, he popularized it, but he never quite perfected it. Um, one of the uh, essential components in uh, that process is machine tools and sort of a un or an overlooked aspect of the Industrial Revolution are the tool makers. I mean, we sort of look at things like the steamboat, but it was the people who made the tools that made the machinery that really deserve a lot of the credit. The invention of the milling machine, the lathe, and things like that, drills, and, and so on. Um, though Without those, those uh, tools, none of this would have even been possible. So we look at something like uh, Fulton. He was really the first person to do this uh, successfully and practically, and that's why he gets a, a lot of the credit, and it's deserved. But um, the, the, the steamboat itself totally revolutionizes transportation, an essential component of business, and opens up a lot of business opportunity that simply did not exist before. The uh, trip is taken up the... Hudson River, which had normally taken three days, he makes the trip in some 32 hours, and of course, 
it gets better and better and better and pretty soon it's you know 12 hours 10 hours to get from New York City to Albany um, an impressive feat at the time and of course makes a lot of business transaction possible because now you can get stuff down within a day one of the people who takes advantage of that is uh, the Commodore, Commodore Vanderbilt, um, sees an opportunity in shipping and actually challenges um, uh, the monopoly that uh, Fulton had been granted on the, the uh, Hudson River uh, and successfully, and he makes uh, uh, Astor's fortune uh, look pretty small by comparison. So all of this activity is happening, and there's a lot of um, opportunity, a lot of money to be made, and a lot of need for organization. And it is about to transform the way that work gets done in America. So let's look at the building blocks of the Industrial Revolution. Here we're looking at a machinery dedicated to textile production. Uh, we see the flying shuttle, the spinning jenny, the spinning mule, uh, the power frame, water wheels, things like that. And it's interesting to note that much of this takes place in textiles. Because if you're going to devote the time and money to the machinery, you're going to want to make sure you're going to get a return on your investment. So if you're going to invent a machine that produces an item that is far beyond the means of most people, then you probably won't get a return on your investment. But if you can invent a machine that brings something everyone needs uh, within their means, such as cheap clothing, which everyone has to wear, uh, then you would uh, profitably spend your time and effort on it. And that's one of the reasons why textiles are where we see these early innovations in the Industrial Revolution. And it, of course, um, improves hygiene and standards of living and of course makes money for a lot of people because there were lots of different ways that you could make money in textiles. But more importantly what happens is it changes the way people work. Most people in the colonial period in the early republic worked in the home. Uh, they may have a shop or they may just do work uh, in their living room and it's very limiting to production. You can do so much and of course you have to be paid for it and things that are made by hand tend to be more expensive. However, with uh, machinery that was too big for a home and too expensive for the average homeowner to purchase, unlike a loom or a spinning wheel, um, it made more sense to locate the, the machinery centrally and bring the people to the building rather than everyone having their own machine. So what we are seeing is the birth of the factory system. And again, it is not the first time people gathered in a place to do work. Uh, it had been going on for a long time, but it's at this moment that it really becomes the defining um, manu it becomes the defining process of manufacturing, the factory system. So here we're looking at uh, the Slater Mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island one of the very first, and of course located near water uh, to make use of, of, of water power. Out of the factory system comes the factory town. I mentioned earlier, you know, you couldn't uh, try to run your business the way uh, the Lowell Mills were run uh, because it would be illegal. But the way that this worked is that you would have uh, buildings with machinery and you would need people to work there. But who you could get um, depended on the type of people that were sort of nearby. If you had uh, people who were farmers, you, you, know, you weren't going to get a lot of men or young men because they needed to work the farms. So what you ended up getting were women. Um, who could supplement their family's income, usually young girls, uh, young women who were not yet married, who would go to these mills and work, and they would often be boarded there. They would essentially live in the company town. And it made sense uh, at the time, uh, but they were worked very hard uh, all day. Um, their um, 
behavior was regulated. Um, there were strict moral codes and curfews and things of that nature. Um, and there were also um, um, activities for them to do outside of work. And the Lowell Mills, uh, in particular, they encouraged uh, the, the women to write and they would publish uh, the Lowell Offering, which was a collection of, of literature, poems, and, and things like that, and it became uh, quite popular. So there were lots of different ways that, that this could be done uh, profitably, but is the early uh, novelty wore off, um, the women started to demand better wages, better working conditions, and things like that, and some of them actually go on strike and, and, and are able to uh, win some concessions. But that's really what sets the tone for the rest of the 19th century when it comes to manufacturing. So all of the things that uh, managers have to face, you know, controlling and staffing and organizing and setting goals and things like that are now really becoming uh, the central role of the business. It isn't just coming up with the ideas uh, such as Fulton Steamboat or uh, the cotton gin is actually putting them into practice for the purposes of production. And that's really the key that makes the manager uh, a new indispensable force in the world of business. I had mentioned that transportation uh, had become um, uh, revolutionized by the steam, uh, uh, steamboat, but another form of transportation um, comes along in 1825, or at least that's when it is finished. It's the Erie Canal. Uh, we're looking at a map of New York State, which has some uh, diagrams of the canal on it. And in the Appalachian Mountain chain, there's only one break, and it's the, Hud it's the Mohawk Valley. And on one side, you have the Hudson River. On the other side, you have the Great Lakes. And geez, if they could just be joined together, it would really open up a lot of opportunity. So um, a plan is um, put into place uh, to dig a canal, 363 miles. It was an engineering masterpiece for its time. The, probably the most complex project up to that point in America. And it, of course, involved the cooperation of public entities, the state of New York, private investment, uh, the uh, management of very large workforces uh, that had to solve lots and lots of problems and uh, build lots of other things other than just the canal, such as feeder canals and towpaths um, and uh, uh, cities along the way. So this was a very complex undertaking that uh, began in 1817 in Rome, New York on the 4th of July. Gr the ground was broke um, and it started working both directions and as it did, it start, people started shipping on it and very soon uh, people are making money on the canal and of course it's opened in October of 1825. And it's after that point that New York really starts to establish itself as what would ultimately become the financial capital of the world. Um, the amount of trade uh, was staggering. It is, it's almost impossible to even put it into numbers. But um, in the 1830s, the canal was making so much money that it almost did not know what to do with it. And it ended up lending money to the federal government. And keep in mind that the canal could not even be used year round. And that its main, the main means of propulsion were mules and horses pulling these uh, packet boats along towpaths. I mean, the whole trip was you were towed by an animal. Um, uh, it's just amazing that it could make so much money, but it did. It led to uh, the formation, or in part, led to the formation of RPI, right? the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, Stephen Van Rensselaer III was the president of the Canal Board and had received um, a request for some money from Amos Eaton, uh, 
uh, for a school that would eventually become a school of science and a school of engineering because of projects like the Erie Canal, these men were in demand. And so we see an entire new entity uh, rise up in terms of education, uh, which of course is its own management entity, um, but um, uh, the Erie Canal made that uh, possible. It also made possible um, merchandising, or I shouldn't say made it possible, but it greatly increased the ability uh, to make money in merchandise and dry goods. Uh, we're looking at the Five Points District and uh, Lumen Reed, um, a man who had made a lot of money, partly because of the Erie Canal, and then devotes himself to uh, patronizing the arts, as many of them uh, do. So this becomes um, not only the canal itself, but all of the economic activity that went along with it, dry goods stores, transportation companies, um, and all of the cities along the way that could transport their um, produce and merchandise to, once you could get to the Hudson, then you're out into the world because you can sail into the Atlantic. Pretty soon, of course, um, steam and um, rail is combined for railroads, and many of the railroads simply followed um, canal routes. So this becomes the new wave of transportation, and uh, to this day, um, rail transport is still the cheapest by ton uh, transportation in, in the United States. The uh, canal itself had a lot of people who um, uh, were a bit coarse. Uh, they liked to gamble and drink and visit prostitutes and things of that nature. The uh, canal also provided a conduit for um, preachers. Uh, they would travel up and down the canal and all the new canal towns and preach uh, to pretty much anybody, like the First Great Awakening. The Second Great Awakening sort of had a mass democratic appeal, democratic participation, a reliance on women, not only to organize the meetings that uh, were frequently held, but also to be the moral guardian of the home. So this is a very um, decentralized um, activity but one with a lot of organization amongst the uh, most important uh, practitioners here. We see uh, Charles Finney and, and Lorenzo Dow, two of the best known. Around the same time that this is happening, Andrew Jackson becomes president. And I included him because uh, in the 19th century, probably no one changed the presidency as much as Jackson. Now, the government at this point is still largely laissez-faire. There is some interference in the economy, but not very much. And um, what's important with uh, Jackson is the degree to which uh, he managed the presidency himself. It was almost like uh, he's this, you know, fountainhead of democracy, but he was pretty autocratic with a lot of things, a man of many, many contradictions. Um, but he also institutes, um, or I should say improves, the spoil system. This was a way for um, people who had supported uh, Jackson to make um, uh, money at various jobs. So they could uh, uh, give their political patronage, and in, in return, uh, they would have a job with the federal government, which of course was now becoming larger and larger. Um, as the states uh, proliferate, uh, you have men like uh, Jackson who were eager to fill those positions with people who uh, supported him. So Jackson himself really um, makes the presidency a much more of a, a micromanager in a certain sense. Um, although, um, you know, it's not like we would call a micromanager today. But um, he definitely uh, changes the nature of the presidency. In opposition to uh, Andrew Jackson, uh, many people were opposed to his policies. Um, they were opposed to letting the, the masses have too much say. Um, and they organize a party 
uh, in opposition to Jackson. And really what we associate with Jackson, in addition to the changing of the presidency and the spoil system, is the organization of party politics, in particular the two-party system. Um, no one had really campaigned for president. You were, it was seen as unseemly. But uh, Martin Van Buren decided, after uh, Jackson lost the election in 1824, to more formally organize politics in a way that would make any manager today uh, very proud. Um, so this system of political organization and political management starts to define uh, the nature of the federal government and eventually state and local governments as well. The party that emerges in opposition to Jackson are the Whigs. Um, they run uh, candidates in 1836. They run three candidates for president and lose. Uh, by 1840, they realize, hey, let's just run one candidate. And uh, interestingly, they hold a national convention to elect or to nominate their candidate for the presidency. And uh, it really shows us how much um, uh, uh, the mechanics of politics are following the new mechanics of the factory system. Uh, they're very, very similar in terms of the level of organization. As the United States is growing, um, that's okay, no problem. Uh, we had uh, a slight interruption there, I apologize. As the United States is growing, um, people are expanding west. And uh, transportation is making that entirely possible. So we have wagon trains, we have um, locomotives. Um, you know, the great move west um, opens up lots of opportunities uh, for new settlements, for new states, which all have to follow a particular path of organization to become states. In addition to the transportation, we have something else that's sort of uh, interesting is uh, Samuel Morse's uh, telegraph. Here we have uh, technology, um, revolutionary technology, um, which in a sense is a form of transportation, the transportation of information. And it turns out that's uh, pretty important to people. Um, once uh, he's able to set up a network of um, telegraph wires, um, people uh, rather like this instantaneous form of communication, even though it's rather cumbersome with Morse code. <clears throat> but the, the company that he founds, uh, Western uh, Telegraph and Telephone, um, uh, becomes enormously complex and enormously profitable. Um, so you have the, the, the country being crisscrossed with uh, all kinds of uh, transportation. The North is uh, far more industrialized than the South. Um, the South had largely stayed agricultural. Uh, commercial farming in the North was much more difficult. So what we want to do now is let's take a look at how the South is faring. So as we looked very early on at the difference between the Chesapeake Bay and the Massachusetts Bay, now we're really going to look at the differences between the North and the South. Um, much of what we think we know about um, the slave-holding South probably comes to us from this very excellent, beautifully filmed, brilliantly acted, but um, reprehensibly uh, historical movie. Um, a lot of things you can say about Gone with the Wind. It is a truly great movie, but watching it makes you cringe uh, from an historical perspective. It is so bad. <laughs> I'm sorry to, uh, to chuckle here. It's just it defies uh, description as to how uh, grossly inaccurate this movie is. And I think uh, in America it uh, colored how a lot of people saw uh, slave owners. So let me uh, explain a few things about slave owning in general. The average Southerner did not own slaves. The average slave owner 
owned fewer than 10. The majority of slaves, however, lived on plantations of 100 slaves or greater. There were a number of them, and of course, when you have that many slaves, it tends to be the bulk of, of, of the uh, statistic. Most planters are living very similar to their own slaves. They are working alongside them. And uh, the interesting thing about slaves in the South is that it's not just a form of labor. It really is a form of status, and that really uh, can't be overstated. Many of these small planters, rather than spending money to improve their living conditions or to purchase more land, would often spend the money on another slave. Just so they say, I have six slaves instead of five, and things like that. Um, it's a really odd uh, way to um, measure yourself, I suppose. Of course, we can say that from our vantage point here. Um, but that really is the tale of the average slave owner. They are very poor uh, working alongside their slaves. Many of the more successful planters, however, live in plantations such as this. And so from a cultural perspective, you know, ju uh, uh, you know just taking out the notion of slavery, I mean, we can look at buildings like this, houses like this, and say they're very beautiful. Um, and some other examples, um, beautiful architecture, and so on. Uh, but on the other hand, um, we have the slaves themselves, and so we can see the, the stark contrast in the way that they're living. Uh, for most slave owners, it was just a matter of keeping these people alive, um, and even then, not always, uh, if you could make an example of a slave, which of course often happened. We can see some of the more famous pictures here. Um, but rather than recount all the horrors of slavery, uh, what is important is to us is to how the, the plantations are managed. Um, the larger plantations have a, a slave driver or an overseer, a man whose job was to be a manager, but whose job was more akin to being a prison warden uh, with a, maybe a sadistic prison warden. Um, slaves who were um, very good workers were pay setters. They were the ones whom the other slaves were expected to keep up with. And there would be some rewards uh, for some of those slaves. They were, you know, given little plots of land that they could farm uh, in their spare time uh, for themselves. And of course, the larger plot of land that a slave could plant was, of course, a, a reward, a mark of status for the slave uh, himself. Uh, and a means of incentive to do better work. But slaves, of course, had lots of ways of rebelling, deliberately slowing the pace of work or breaking a tool or things like that. So there was a lot of attention back and forth. But the uh, profit um, for cotton was uh, astronomical. And in fact, uh, cotton becomes the, the main cash crop of America, which, as I had said earlier, the uh, planters had already translated much of their um, economic wealth into political power, um, and that had uh, certainly uh, continued. So you have these people who are very wealthy, politically powerful. Um, they're not running the day-to-day -day operations of their, um, of their plantations. So in a certain sense, they're a bit detached from them. Um, the main job fell to the overseers, the managers. Um, slavery uh, becomes this almost like a drug. It's not something that these men uh, were willing to give up under any circumstances, even if a, a, a suitable alternative could have been found. Um, they never would have accepted it. They find all kinds of ways to justify uh, the institution of slavery. Um, none of them are, of course, legitimate. But the, the, um, the, the plantation really becomes the economic engine of the South. And with the demand uh, for cotton, um, the advances in textile machinery, 
which made clothing uh, very affordable to people, um, was difficult to stop. So in a sense, uh, cotton uh, truly was king. But it creates a problem um, for the country because the North is increasingly becoming opposed to slave power. And that's a bit different than opposing slavery. They really, uh, many in the North thought that the slave owners were just simply becoming too politically powerful. Although, uh, there are a lot of different fronts to this fight. And we'll look at how different organizations uh, got together and um, uh, tried to fight it. One of them is the birth of the Republican Party uh, in 1854, which runs its first candidates for president in 1856. This is a political party, the Republican Party of today, that is organized with lots of different people with lots of different ideas. However, the one thing that united them was opposition to slavery. Another strain of uh, anti-slavery, if we want to call it all anti-slavery, is abolition. And here we see William Lloyd Garrison and uh, Frederick Douglass in the two newspapers uh, that they published. Uh, so the abolition movement becomes a more organized form uh, of opposition, as does uh, literature. Here we see um, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, by Harriet Beecher Stowe, a very, very uh, forceful book in um, uh, raising the issue to the American public. And then you have a uh, sort of legal aspect of this, uh, which brings the Supreme Court in, is the Dred Scott decision, in which uh, Dred Scott, a, form, a slave, had been brought to the North and said, there's no slavery in the North, therefore I am free. He sues for his slavery. Uh, it makes its way to the Supreme Court. And uh, just the Supreme uh, Chief Justice Atani uh, uh, rules that, in fact, he is uh, property. Um, what this means, more than anything, and, and the ruling is that when a person crosses state lines, they do not give up their right to property. And this, in fact, is true. When you cross a state line, you don't give up your rights to property. You still own the property you own. The problem here, of course, was that they considered people to be property. The problem for the North here is that if you don't give up your property rights, then effectively slavery is not illegal in the North. If slavery was illegal in the North. It had been abolished. So a slave owner could simply bring all of his slaves in the North and there would be nothing anyone could do about it. And probably that decision, more than anything, uh, touched off uh, the powder keg. And so we have men like John Brown, um, bleeding Kansas, and uh, uh, the, the raid at Harper's Ferry. Um, it's uh, really becoming um, uh, contentious. We see lots of grassroots um, opposition, uh, very well organized which uh, culminates in 1860 uh, with the election of Abraham Lincoln. And you can see that the country uh, fairly divided between uh, the North and the South. So now uh, politics and business uh, are really at loggerheads because the business uh, concerns here happen to be the issue of slavery. This was not an issue of states' rights. I mean, in a sense it is, but the state's rights were mainly because of slavery. So it really all does boil down to slavery. And with the election of Abraham Lincoln, uh, the southern states secede from the Union. And we have the Civil War. Uh, I won't discuss the Civil War uh, other than it's typical in the sense of, of um, the other wars that you have the same uh, issues of management. Um, but the next lecture, uh, we will look at the growth of big business at the end of the 19th century and uh, what is sometimes uh, referred to as the second industrial revolution. So I thank you for listening to this lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you.